Welcome to the MVP Show. Today we're joined by a man who's not only a business apps MVP, he's also a scrum master, community organizer, event speaker, author, and successful online trainer, Neil Benson. For full show notes, please visit nz365guide.com forward slash 115. Now let's get on with the show. Hey there, Neil. Welcome to the MVP show. Time for take two. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be on again so soon. Again. On so soon. Sorry, uh, audience, you missed the first one for whatever reason. Part of our audio did not come through, so we're re-recording this so you can hear the dulcet tones of Mr. Benson. Well, let's just consider that first one to be a dress rehearsal. And tonight, this is the main show. This is the real deal. So... You know, you're pretty famous around MVP circles, Neil. You've been around the, the traps for a long time. You've published two books. You've got heavily into, uh, you know, scrum and agile side of things. You've got your online course. We'll, we'll link to all those in the show notes. Tell me, what did you want to be? or where? What did you want to be growing up? Well, I don't think I was named after Neil Armstrong, but it's funny when you reflect back on this week's 50 years since the moon landing, I definitely you know, wanted to grow up being an astronaut. I had lots of space books and astronaut costumes and all those kind of things. I definitely dreamed of going into space. That would have been, that would have been fantastic. Mate, it certainly would have. I just wouldn't want to be on that, that one, that, the one or two that blew up on re-entry. No, for sure. <laughs> um, so tell me, you've got a couple of children. Um, you live in uh, Queensland, specifically Brisbane, Australia? That's right. I live in Brisbane in Queensland, Australia. So it's halfway up the East Coast. And uh, the nickname is Bris Vegas because it's, you know, the sunshine capital and fun capital of the world. Yeah. I took a cruise ship out of there once to cruise the Pacific. Totally amazing. And so how many children do you have? You're married or you're just uh, living in sin? Married to Natasha. Uh, We've been together for 20 years. We uh, have three little kids, Jensen, uh, Zana and Mia. That's six and four and two. I I must get bonus prizes for remembering all of their names and ages. I reckon, I reckon. So what, what do your kids think you do? Um, my, well, uh, my little boy asked me the other day, he said, Danny, how much do they pay you for your podcasts? I was like, that's a good question, Jensen. I, I got to ask, <laughs> I got to ask Mark how much he's going to pay me for appearing on his podcast. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll blow you a kiss. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, and, uh, of course my kids helped me putting together all the Lego minifigures that I use to illustrate nice. my blog articles, my website, my, uh, yeah, my, my uh, courses as well. So what, what, but what do they think you do? Like, do, do, have they ever discussed like, why does, you know, dad disappear for the middle of the day? And yeah, yeah. They know I've got a job and I go out and do Microsoft software stuff and I've got my podcast and I do online courses. They they know all of that and they help me out with a lot of it. So they're getting fairly clued in. I love to you know teach my kids the value of hard work so they don't get any pocket money. They collect the recycling, they help me with the grass, they wash the car, they do chores around the house and they get paid and that's the well, that's the way it works. Oh, uh, you know, it, you just reminded me Stephen Covey, you know, uh you know, has had a family meeting with and and, and talked about how do you kind of share responsibilities in a home. And I liked this, um, what they did is that as a family, they sat down and basically created a list of everything that has to be done to make the home work. This is everything from paying the mortgage to cutting the lawns to, you know, all these type of things. And then they, they basically put them out on post-it notes and said, okay, we each need, we each live in the home. Who, who needs to contribute what? And so um, he took the mortgage payments, right? Because the kids couldn't pay the mortgage and there were certain things that they couldn't do. So that obviously the parents took them, but what it naturally left were the chores that the kids could p- pick up. And it, you know, gave them a sense of responsibility to being part of this family and home that this was their contribution, just like daddy and mummy had their contributions. I just thought it was such a really good way to get them to rather than task them with something, but they actually felt like this was their part of the home contribution. That's very cool. So what's the best lesson you've learned from whether it be a parent, family member, maybe a mentor or somebody you've worked with in business? What do you reckon the best lesson in life you've learned from somebody else specifically rather than just a book or something like that? Oh, I was good. Before you said not a book, I was going to mention a, a book that I read when I was in my 20s, Benjamin Graham's Intelligent Investor. Um, it was probably a $20 investment and 
I've made a million dollars from that book. So that was a fairly good investment. Um, and I took my little boy along to Joey Scouts tonight. So Joey's is the part of the scout movement you can go into. So boys and girls between five, six, seven years old. And I was in the scout movement um, throughout my childhood. And I learned some wonderful lessons there about teamwork, about leadership, about serving others, about helping my community. And yeah, I couldn't name a sp specific event, but I had some great scout leaders and taught me a lot. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So what what age did you start in Scouts in? So I started in the Scouts. I was a beaver scout back in Northern Ireland and I was six years old. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. That's so cool. As in, uh, I, I do think it's something that we don't see as much these days. I hadn't, I haven't heard of the word Scouts in so many years, but obviously still, still a program that exists. Sea Scouts is another one, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So how did you get started in dynamics if you like because i assume you started in dynamics here across other areas of microsoft business applications now but how did you get started i was originally a sales guy uh, let me you won't believe this given my position on a certain recruitment company but I, I started out after university as an it contract recruiter no way oh man you're, you're kidding me this shocks me I don't think I've ever admitted that in public before, but there you go. Uh, you heard it here first, folks. Um, so I started basically in sales. I used a, my first CRM application was called Cardbox, and I kept notes and all the candidates and all the calls and all their skills. I loved it. It was a really good system. You could search and find people and check their availability. And then uh, I kind of, uh, we, we got acquired. We were now part of a national group and I'd hit my target and I was bored of, well, not bored. I was fed up with a new CRM system that this new group had introduced. And eventually they, they kicked me into the IT department, said, go and help them fix it. So I did a tour of all the other offices, mapped out all their processes, made a list of all the things that we wanted to change about the software. And I produced this report. And I said, that was, I really enjoyed that. It was like a four week project. And I said, what, what is that called? And it was like, well, that, that's, you just done a business analyst's job. It's like, oh, that's fantastic. How do I do more of that? And so, my sales career ventured into actually CRM software sales. And then just, I became more and more technical in, in pre-sales and in consulting and eventually leading teams of developers to implement Microsoft Dynamics. So in 2000 and 2006, I just finished a big um, project management job for Rackspace, the hosting company in the US, and loved their business model, loved the, the hosting, monthly subscriptions, fanatical support. And I really wanted to do that with with CRM software. So I phoned up Salesforce, Sage, and Microsoft. I'd done quite a bit of work with Sage. I'd done a little work, um, well, I'd heard of Salesforce and come across them and used them for a year. And both of those were pretty partner unfriendly. So Sage said, oh yeah, buy all the software up front from us, pay us thousands of dollars per user, and then you can rent it for whatever you can get. It's like, whoa, that sounds pretty capital intensive. Uh, Salesforce, like, no, no, we host it. Uh, you can become a consulting partner, but that's it. Microsoft said, yep, absolutely. We're, we'd love to talk to hosting partners. And so I became one of the UK's first CRM hosting partners way before CRM Online launched in the UK. Wow, wow. And th well, this is interesting. This is something like I, I only found out at user group the other day. In London, I was at a, uh, there was a pub quiz that Andrew Bibby was putting on at the end of the uh, event. And it was who started the user group in the United Kingdom. <laughs> yeah. And of course uh, it was it was you. That's right. Yeah. Back in oh, probably 2010, 2011, um, we had our first meeting in Red uh, Redmond in Reading in west of London. And we managed to get together probably 30 or 40 people there for, for an afternoon. And I, I cobbled together a few speakers and, and that was the start of things. And, you know, today there's hundreds of people come for an all day user group meeting. It's amazing. It's just, it's blowing up over there. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's a massive event. And, uh, you know, I know Adam Vera did a lot around that. And also now Sarah Critchley and Andrew and Scott Dura, they're all just, you know, hitting home runs and what they're doing. Uh, Lucy Muscat's another one heavily involved in it. It's so good to see how it's growing and continuing to grow and, and be such a key key engagement or point of engagement for the community. You've had your fair share of, um, of, of starting up user groups, Mark. So you're, you're also one to watch. So thanks for everything you've done, particularly here in Australia. So yeah, good on you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all good. It's all positive. So tell me, um, if there was only one thing that you could say, this is the thing I love most about what I do, what would it be? 
the, the privilege that we have is helping our customers improve their customer experience. We've we've all been on the receiving end of a terrible customer experience, whether it's from your government, from a department store, from an online store, or some service provider, particularly you know utility companies, and we've all had we've seen headlines about airlines who treat their customers badly. The job that we have, we're so privileged that we get to transform those experiences into something positive. We get to work with business leaders, visionaries who are transforming the way that their industries work, the way that their organizations work. And I, I love that. I love helping salespeople sell more and earn bigger bonuses. I love helping customer service people, you know, engage their customers and, and create delight among their customers. That's a real, you know, for for a bunch of nerds like us, that's that's you know a complete bonus. It's nice. It's nice. So tell, tell me, um, you know, you've been running um, scrum training now for some time, online learning. You got a lot of people gone through that training. What's, have you got any kind of um, testimonial type stories that kind of, will, you know, shows the impact you've had with various people around the world and that training? Well, th thanks for the question, first of all. But yes, we've had hundreds of students go through it. We've had a, a large proportion of them become certified you know, professional scrum masters with scrum.org, one of the big certification bodies, which is just an awesome you know, set of, of students to be involved with. I, I do get lots of thank yous and lots of um, good questions about people who have obviously you know, they've taken it on board. They're transforming how they uh, deploy Microsoft Dynamics software for their customers or for their users, um, which is great to see. And obviously, I've got to work with a lot of my own teams. And somebody in my, actually, he's a former MVP working in a, as a developer in one, one of my teams at the moment, and said, you know, this is just the best project team I've ever got to work with. And this guy's been in the, been in the business for 20-something years and just really, in, we're, we're a week and a half away from our first big release into production. And the stakes couldn't be higher, and we're all pretty relaxed cruising here towards our first big release because we've done a great job, but we've just learned how to work together. And I think Scrum just gives developers that sense of achievement and a nice, steady, calm, sustainable pace that, that makes our jobs a joy. Yeah, so good, so good. What, uh, what frustrates you in what you do? I don't get too frustrated. I'm a pretty mild-mannered kind of person. I do have a little, you know, I, I pull the leg of my product owner whenever she changes her mind on the requirements. Like, uh, this new story, do you realize that's reversing a story that we did six prints ago? Um, that's not frustrating. That's just me trying to make sure that we're headed in the right direction and she's getting good value for money. Um, I, you know, I get frustrated by, by bad drivers. I live in Queensland. So <laughs> if anything upsets me, it's probably that. What, what makes you the most proud of what you've done? The most the most proud moment I had was probably it, it was a, a a terrible situation. So I was running this hosting company in the UK, and we had grown too quickly. We had taken on lots of servers, we had I'd taken on lots of staff, and when you sell hosting services, your revenues come in pretty slowly, month by month. But your outlays were typically all at the front, so it was still quite a capital intensive business, and we were starting to run out of cash. I went to see an accountant and she said, yep, you've got to declare bankruptcy. You're operating in an insolvent business. So I had a couple of weeks to scramble and we managed to divest that business. All of my staff on new jobs with the, the company that acquired us. Uh, we rescued, we made sure all of our customers were safe, their hosted systems were safe. But that was a really, it could have been a terrible time. It could have gone very badly, but I was really pleased that it turned out really well. So it's, I wish it had gone better. I had dreams of, of selling the business for millions of dollars and buying a supercar. And in the end, all I had was enough money left over to hire a supercar for four laps at a track in, in north of England. Wow. I think uh, your story pretty much reflects mine there. Um, it's, it's uh, yeah, we start businesses with grand visions. And um, at the end of the day, right, not enough capital can, you know, absolutely wipe you out and, and makes it very, very difficult. But, um, I, you know. For me, I looked at it as an expensive degree. It's, it was the degree of life, right? Rather than maybe a university degree and it's practical. And I tell you, I, I found I made decisions off it that have set me in good stead for a lot of other decisions, you know, that, that you know, have led me in life. So that's good, man. That's good that you kind of recovered it, got it sorted out, got everybody, you know, sorted and covered. Um, it's often an area that um, we don't talk about much, if you like, because it uh, can be seen as, a failure, but uh, you know they say statistically those of those businesses that fail, that the business owner starts another business, the likelihood of success is through the roof because of those lessons learned. You know, 
Well, thanks for that, because I'm, I'm plotting the next big enterprise. So here we go again. Yeah. Nice, 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 nice. Now, I think we do learn as we we constantly grow. So what's uh, are, are you planning on releasing more training content? I would love to. Uh, yes, I am planning. Yes, it's in the works. Um, the presentation is done. It's actually going to be a free course. So today my I've got this Scrum for Microsoft Dynamics 365 course. I'm going to be revamping that. Uh, and I'm going to also going to be launching a free course to go alongside it to talk about the benefits of Scrum and uh, some of those things. So it's a precursor to the main course. And then I've got deep dive courses planned in the future as well. So those courses are already uh, being written. In fact, I'm presenting some of the content from those future courses at the Dynamics Power Conference in Sydney uh, on the 3rd of August and then in Auckland on the 21st of August. Wow, very good. So uh, so you're gone. Now, I take it these speaking gigs that you get are part of being an MVP, are they? Or do you have to proactively or do they come and ask you? How does that all work? Oh, a bit of both. You know, um, I know the conference organizers. Uh, I make sure that I'm aware of the call for papers. So a call for papers is when a conference organizer asks people to submit their ideas for topics for the that they're willing to present. So I make sure I jump on those, write something that sounds exciting, relevant, uh, in demand. And as long as I've got a good idea, I'm happy to submit it. And then I've just got to figure out where I can travel and when I can go and those kinds of things as well. I've got to fit it in around my work schedule. Yeah, yeah. What advice would you give to an, a person considering becoming an MVP? I, I mean, uh, and I'll put some context around this. One of the things that um, a Canadian MVP said and here, like I said, Canadian MVP, because in my mind, I'm like, what's his name? What's his name? What's his name? But there it is. I just got a Rick McCutcheon. <laughs> it's finally come to me. He said that, you know, if, you, uh, if you're if you a consultant and you do a nine to five job and you kind of, you know, you could just as much be doing this on Salesforce as something else. Um, but if you really see that this is your career, that you're dead set, that you study on your own time, you learn, you want to master and become a master, you know, of this technology space, you absolutely should set your sights on becoming an MVP because it will enhance your career if your goal is to live in this, um, you know, Microsoft biz app space. What advice then would you give to people that have made that choice that they've said, you know, we, I am going to, you know, I'm going to invest the next, you know, 10 plus years of my life and I only go to 10 years because, you know, stats tell us that people change totally go into different industries, you know, um, or, and take different career journeys, you know, through their, their career. But let's say individuals are in that space. What advice would you give to them to kind of get to a point that they could get nominated? Well, Mark, I've been doing this for 10 years now, so maybe I'm due for a career change. I'm the last person you want to take advice from. <laughs> um, so I get asked the same question quite a lot. How do I become an MVP? And my, my question back to people who ask me that question is show me the community contribution that you're most proud of. And quite often they come back and go, oh, haven't got one. Like, come on, you haven't got one blog article? You haven't got one uh, user group presentation that you've done? You haven't got a, a profile on one of the forums where you've answered a couple of dozen questions? You haven't been involved in, in the online user groups? Come on, you must have done something. You want to become an MVP, right? That's what you said. No, I haven't. I don't know where to start. Okay, well, you need to start doing some of those things. Find, you know, every day, write down something that you learned on your job, getting paid for, but write, write down something that you learned today. At the end of the week, you got five or six ideas. Pick one, talk about it, blog about it, write about it, record a video or a podcast about it. Do that for six months and reevaluate it. Are you enjoying that? Because if you, if you enjoy that, keep going. If you enjoy it for another 18 months after that, then you're on your way to becoming an MVP. But if you don't enjoy it, give up. Just, you know, take up a hobby in your spare time instead. Because, you know, we, we do this for the love of it, not for the recognition, not for the, you know, you know trophy or the awards. It's, um, it's for the love of being involved and, and giving back. So true. And I mean, you know, I, I agree that, that kumbaya, you know, the love of it, et cetera, is really, really important part. But I've seen a lot of MVPs that became MVPs and within, you know, three months were offered new roles as in, you know, uh, partners sought them out. They got pay rises, not necessarily within their current employer, but 
were definitely there's tangible benefits right to becoming an MVP that um that I mean they're not guaranteed but they definitely there are tangible benefits. Oh for sure. You know, I I benefited from those and I'm I'm really fortunate and that's why I work so hard to stay within the program and and keep contributing to the community not just because I love it because it, it does open up doors and open up opportunities, not just to speak, not just to visit Redmond every year, but yeah, for sure, whenever whenever I'm looking for a new role, it, it absolutely helps. It, people don't always understand what it means. Quite often, I get mistaken for a technical guru. Oh, you're an MVP. You must be able to fix our problem over here. Um, it's not always the case. Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. So uh, let's, let's just go through some wrap-up questions, and let's start with a doozy. I think this will be right up your alley. Uh, who do you think of when you think of the word punchable? <laughs> oh, does it have to be one of the current MVPs? It can be a current MVP if you want, yeah. Because, uh, you know, Matt Wedderman's leaving uh, leaving the Netherlands and he, he's not moving to Australia. He, he looks pretty punchable to me right now. Come on, Matt, what are you doing, man? You should be moving to Australia with us. Um, no, uh, I'm not a big fan of some of the politicians that are kicking around at the moment. So I think some of those um, those folks are fairly punchable. Um, but no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a peaceful kind of guy. I don't go, don't go around hitting people. Okay, so... What's the best piece of tech you own? So if so, you know, if there was one bit of tech that you have, what would it be? I'm pretty low tech these days. I've gone through spells of having to have the latest phone, the latest gadgets. I had a had a running watch whenever I was big into endurance running that I loved. Um, these days, I've I've got a couple of Sonos Play One speakers. Um, my kids learn to play Spotify through Alexa on that. Um, that, that that's probably my my best recent investment. So Alexa dots or something like that. The, no, it's the Sonos uh, Play One. Oh, okay, uh, and so, speakers. so so Sonos runs on Alexas, does it? Yes, you can run Alexa or the, the Google Assistant. Both run on Sonos. Do they really? Yeah. Because I th- I thought one blocked the other from using it for a while. Um, well, the Google Assistant's recently come to Sonos in Australia, so it's probably been available in other regions a little bit earlier. <laughs> you know, in Australia, we're always a little bit behind. Um, but uh, no, you can get um, the Google Assistant on there as well. Ah, okay, okay. Awesome. Good to know, good to know. Mate, it's been great having you on the show. Before you go, um, if people want to either get on one of your courses, follow, you know, what you're talking about or doing online, how can they find you? So my online alias is Customary, which is the name of the company that I founded in 2009. So you can follow me on Twitter on Customary. That's the word customer with a Y on the end. Um, I'm Neil Benson on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, I'd love to catch up with any of your listeners and uh, do what I can to help them either with Scrum or trying to become an MVP. Hey, thanks for listening. Do you want to become an MVP? There's no secret sauce or special formula to becoming an MVP, but you definitely can learn from those who have gone through the nomination process and been awarded as an MVP. So if you want to become an MVP, subscribe to the show uh, and catch up with the MVPs and learn from their stories. Full show notes can be found at nz365guide.com forward slash 115. I look forward to seeing you next week.